happy to stick around and, and answer any questions at the end of the presentation that, that you may have. So, so since our last meeting, uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen about 24,000 new, uh, new user accounts created. Uh, since our last meeting, which actually, uh, uh, funny enough, surpasses the half million user creation mark. So uh, a pretty big accomplishment for our, for our little program here. Uh, that equates to about 40,000 envelopes per day and about 45 to 50,000 filings per day as well. And 79% of those transactions uh, actually come through our state filing portal with 21% of those going through some of our other commercial uh, EFSP vendors. And since our last meeting on the, uh, the JP front, we've added one new uh, Justice of the Peace, and that's Ector County. We've had a few more precincts uh, added, to the, uh, added to the system as well. And we still have uh, currently six active engagements uh, working as we speak with seven more in the pipeline ready to go as soon as those ones are, are completed. Um, they, say that one more time. My apologies. Uh, so in total, that added about five, about 5,000 more filings per month. We saw about 114,000 filings total uh, in October, and JPs in total contribute about uh, a little more than 110,000 filings per month on average, which is, which is pretty good considering the, uh, that our JPs are, are, are not mandated. So um, as most of you know, uh, there's been a, a new review tool implementation that's been going on the, the past uh, few months. So um, Microsoft deprecated Silverlight support on October 12th. And during that time, Tyler has, has worked diligently to transition our user base over to our new review application, which is built on, our, on HTML5. Um, it's no secret that we had, we've had a, a few bumps along the way but we think the clerks have acclimated that very well. The average filings we've seen uh, in this time frame is uh, about 40, is a little over 49,000 filings processed per day. And in uh, October, we saw we saw rejection rates uh, at six percent, which is which is the lowest we've seen in the last six months. So between January and September, uh, we saw around a 91 percent. Um, a 91% review time for five, for envelopes within 24 hours. And in October, during the transition, we did see that dip a little bit uh, by two percentage points to around 89%. Uh, when we look at those numbers a little, a little more closely, we see that it seemed to be the top 10 most populous counties were impacted more, which, which makes sense because the top 10 counties have a significantly higher volume than um, those counties outside the top 10. So um, some of those, some of those intermittent performance issues that we had experienced over the time, and, and some of the defects we've been working to resolve, did contribute to to the drop off a little bit. But that's something that Tyler is intensely focused on between now and our next meeting to to uh, get um, to get resolved. And we're going to be focusing on continued optimization of the application and continued defect mitigation through our our rapid deployment. And continuous improvement model where we actually see new version updates every single week. So uh, additionally, in October, we saw a dramatic increase in our support volume due to the new solution. When we dig into the reported incidents a little bit further, we see a lot of these are actually duplicated. So for example, we'll have one issue that comes in and we may see dozens of reports from various counties about this single issue. So what this does is it, 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 it contributes to a a pretty hefty support backlog that we're working to that we're working to uh, chew through uh, over the next coming months. Um, so, uh, on top of that, our rapid deployment model, because we're able to bring we're able to bring um, new de new defect mitigation and new features on such a on such a fast paced basis, where we're we're putting that out weekly instead of monthly or even annually. Um, it, it's put us in a unique position where our development team is actually able to outpace our support team's ability to communicate to manually communicate those resolutions via our, our support portal and get that feedback to our stakeholders. Um, in the short term, to help combat that, we've hired staff to tackle this backlog. Um, but long term, we will be implementing an automation and automation between our development ticketing system 
in our support portal, uh, where whenever a developer or our development team closes out a particular issue, it's going to automatically update the uh, the support ticket. Uh, so that way we can actually get our clerks can get feedback in real time uh, where the issue status currently is. So during this time, we really, really appreciate our stakeholders patience during this transition period. All of our development uh, focus and energy is dedicated to improving our new solutions, improving our processes, instead of investing that time in, in some of our dying products. Uh, and I think the results of these efforts are going to set really set our foundation uh, for our eFile Texas 2.0 uh, development projects. So Evan, back on that slide, I've got a question for you. Sure. There's still a little, a blue chunk in that, that last bar. Is there a timeline that the other counties that are still on Silverlight are going to get off of Silverlight? Uh, so I, ideally it would be, so the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the slightly longer answer is it depends on what the issue is that's, it, that's impacting a particular county. Some of, some of our counties, uh, for example, Denton, D.C., uh, who we've worked out a, a partnership with them where some of their judges fall back to Silverlight to sign and review and forward orders. The, the, the big contributing factor to them having to do that was actually in the production version update that we pushed out last night. So what we'll be doing is reaching out to these individual counties for the issues they reported following up with them, letting them know where their issue currently stands, if it's in production, work to see and verify if that issue is resolved and start to move them off of Silverlight back over the URV application. Um, all, all told, uh, current projections show that we could, if everything stays status quo and we were able to mitigate these, these defects in the pace that we're currently keeping, um, we should be able to get everybody off by uh, mid-December and back over to the new um, review application, but um, again, we'll, we'll be keeping in close contacts with these counties and these offices that we have worked out this process with. Tracy, did you have something? Yes. So, Evan, um, for all the uh, issues on the reviewer tool and the uh, features, the Silverlight features that still have yet to be implemented, what is the projected date for all of that to be complete? To be complete, or do you mean as far as the uh, the defects or or in totality? The, the defects and the Silverlight features that still haven't been implemented. So our Silverlight feature parity, it's going to continue on through the end of this year, and we even have some of the the lower priority features that aren't as often used, even moving into uh, early next year. But what we've done is we we've worked really hard to to um, get the to to get our feedback from not from our texas uh stakeholders and across the nation to see where these these certain features need to be prioritized and what needs to go ahead of the others and keep in mind we also have to balance this with some of our critical defects for that we're trying to resolve as well all told um i believe we're going to have uh a, the most critical uh feature parity items uh, complete before the end of the year. And some of those defects and some of those less less prioritized features are going to continue through our sprints that we have all the way through March of next year. Um, again, some of this is pretty fluid depending on what's reported and, and what continues to be reported for some of our counties. And are you going to continue the weekly rollout? Yes, that, that's something that's going to continue into perpetuity. And then I think, Mark, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, hi Evan. Uh, I, you mentioned that there was some uh, some lag between dealing with development and support on the clerk side. What about on the attorney side? And uh, I may maybe I'm I should know this, and uh, or you're going to address it later. But is is there a solution um, for attorneys with you know uh, FAQs and and problems and uh, is there any type of like sort of automation in response? Like you know you get automated answers that are, are pre-programmed if they're asking a question about standards. Uh, we had a problem a couple months ago with PDFs and I think y'all helped us with that. And, and it had to do with everything from embedded fonts to stuff we were getting from court reporters to images and processing. And Terry was, was also very helpful in that. So my question is, uh, you know, is there anything like that for the attorney side that are running into uh, that, that take advantage in, I guess, in a suggestive I'm suggesting, you know, some sort of automation in terms of helping 
in that in that way. So I, I can I can answer that in a, a couple different parts. As far as our internal automation for um, providing feedback from the development team on issues that are reported from either our file support team, or our core support team, that autom- that automation will will um, be both support teams will be take advantage of that automation and be able to get instant feedback with some of these issues are resolved. And of course, what version of the either the Tyler new Tyler filing portal or the new version of the reapplication that fix will be in. The extra wrinkle where we have with the the um, attorney support or the file support team is it's not it's not the attorneys that are interacting directly with the with the our with our incident management system. There is that additional layer where it goes through our file support. So we don't have as instant of a feedback model, but something that we could take advantage of is things like our chat bot, where if if there is a a prevalent issue that's reported, such as um, you know, the, the, the most optimal PDF formats that you submit, um, we can, what we can do is use, utilize technologies like our chat bot, put out support articles um, based on that feedback, based on the resolutions our developer provide, and we can surface that to our filing community for them to be able to search for answers and solutions to problems that may have previously been reported. Hey, Mark, I can, I can add a little bit more color as well. So one of the transitions that we're doing here is migrating our support tools also to the cloud. And so that affords us a lot of opportunities to do some unique things that we haven't really had the latitude to do in the past. Uh, things like, like, uh, like Evan mentioned with regards to a chatbot, but also uh, significantly improve our, our knowledge base articles. And so you know, what we find is that there are... Um, a few dozen articles that are the most commonly used articles for each jurisdiction and prioritizing those and getting those up to the top, whatever someone asks a question, uh, helps get them to that answer uh, easier. And so being able to intelligently route them to that and say, hey, we noticed that you asked a question about this. Here are the top three articles that may impact your, um, your question or may help you address your question. And if those aren't there, then you can then talk to a representative who can help route you there. So those are some of the things that we're doing. The chat bot is one, obviously, um, but uh, really getting uh, the callers into the right knowledge base article to find the information quickly and rapidly and trying to mimic some of the uh, more commonly used practices in the commercial space uh, here for, for supporting our legal professionals. So if you ever go in and you try to <clears throat> you know, get help from you know, like an Amazon, for example, usually they give you a few articles to say, hey, is this, is, did these help you? And if not, then they quickly route you into a support contact. And we'll, we'll try to mimic some of those processes, but being able to move to the cloud affords us those opportunities. So, um, so that's part of it. The additional workflow between our development ticketing system and the, um, the uh, communication outbound to our legal professionals will also improve with that workflow process that, uh, that we mentioned before. Uh, and then, of course, we're also um, adding different channels to be able to support the legal professional community members um, as well. So a lot of things that we're doing that are on the horizon, but uh, getting to the cloud, obviously, is the first part of that. Uh, I will say that there is a, a very uh, significant emphasis on uh, refactoring the state-provided filing portal, and uh, we've received significant feedback on how to improve that experience. And so uh, we've we've got a team that we've developed to do just that and just improve that experience. So uh, in the next couple of months, you'll start to see some dramatic changes to that filing portal uh, for the better, taking into some of the considerations that we've been provided by our legal professional community on how to improve that performance. One of the things that uh, was, was really brought up in those dialogues was uh, the uh, first step in that process in that new portal of uploading the document. Uh, the legal professional community members that we spoke to, so they didn't like that. They'd rather have that uh, back in the, um, the subsequent steps like it was in the past. So we'll be making those changes uh, here over the next couple of months. But love to get your feedback, Mark, as we do and see if, if we're moving in the right direction. And if not, how can we pivot to do just that? Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Any other questions on this slide? And um, Evan, this is John Horn. I, I have some questions, but I'm not quite sure if it's related to this. It may be. Um, we're experiencing some, we're still experiencing some minor issues as we move from Silverlight. Um, uh, 
and, and while they are minor, we give the volume of uh, cases that we're given, it creates a significant problem and it reduces the, uh, the time for us to uh, process um, documents in e-file. For example, um, uh, if we get money, we, it's uh, money being captured from the rejected envelope. It's, it's capturing the money if while we're rejecting the balance, but it still captures the money. Um, pages can't rotate. Um, and uh, when we, it, it won't allow you to place the file stamp where it should be. Uh, you have to accept it, then go back and change. So when are those, um, while they are small issues, but they have a big impact, when are those gonna be resolved? So the, the first one uh, about rejected filing still capturing money, that one's, that one's new to me and I, I, I'd like to dig into that one a little bit more. The second one about the rotate page, we actually is going into our stage version that we're deploying um, this afternoon uh, to the stage environment, which means it'll likely hit production um, next week uh, on the 18th. Uh, and the last one, as far as the stamps not, not placing correctly, we've got a, there's a few different um, flavors of that issue. Uh, some of it's dependent on the stamp itself, whether it's auto or manual. Some of it's dependent on the document that it's actually being applied to. So there's a, a, a few different combinations of that issue that we're looking to resolve. And we've got, we've got several derivative, derivatives of that fix that are in the current version that we actually deployed today. Uh, the version that we're deploying to stage, um, or excuse me, the version we deployed last night to production, the version we're deploying to stage today, and the version we'll be deploying to stage next week in production um, next week as well. So uh, all that to say over the next two to three versions, a lot of our emphasis, emphasis has been on um, annotation improvement, whether that be uh, getting around that, so that pop-up error that, come, that happens uh, sometimes when you annotate a document, um, annotating a document forwarding to another queue, um, some of the uh, network failure message, messages that you receive, which are actually underlying uh, document conversion errors. So we'll be tackling that in twofold is, is one, surfacing a more coherent error message to users instead of kind of that generic network failure message. So you have a better understanding of what the issue is. And then secondly, actually tackling the underlying problem that was preventing that document from uh, being converted. So over the next two to three versions, that's where a lot of our emphasis is going to is going to rely. And, and the purpose of that is those are some of the issues that we are seeing that are reported that are causing uh, our our clerks to have to fall back to Silverlight as a workaround to be able to continue to keep up with the volume. So we'd like to get those addressed first. That way we can get you back over to the review application. We can continue our efforts moving Silverlight behind Tyler's network and ultimately deprecating altogether. And then, um, as you say, start to start to knock out some of those more minor issues, so that we can see this this uh, eighty eight percent or eighty nine percent pick back up to the ninety one ninety two percent of processing time that we typically see, and get you guys back to your status quo. Thank you, sir. Hey, Evan, this is Roy Ferguson. I have a, I have a question for you. Again, sure. I don't feel like John whether this is the right slide for it, but it's related to the rollout of one of the recent versions. Uh, my coordinator explained that as we go into each morning docket, what she was doing previously was uh, hitting into e-file to see if there were any last minute filings that maybe hadn't yet been processed. Uh, in these rural counties, the clerks don't have time in the morning or five minutes before or during a hearing to be scanning files. And so the only way I knew that a reply or a continuance had been filed the night before or five minutes before was that the coordinator would open e-file and see if anything had been submitted. And she said, since one of the recent rollouts, that authority is gone. And now she has no way of seeing that. She, she thought she could do it through research. And so she would now open e-file research and the CMS. And yet in no way could she access any of those last minute filings until the clerk moved it into a queue or accepted it. And the clerks aren't able to do that in these rural counties when you have an 80 case docket day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a glitch? Is that a, a permissions problem? Or was that an intentional change to the system? So, well, for permissions issue, we'd have to, we'd have to double check on that. But if they had the permission to do something like this in Silverlight, that permission should be transmitted over to the new vehicle. What this, what this sounds like 
is that the, the clerk was opening up what we call the all active filing search uh, on the My Filings tab and running a report and checking to see if anything was submitted within a certain time. We've actually just added that feature as of the previous version uh, that went to production. Uh, and then what we've also done in this version, um, we've, uh, we've fixed some of the, a couple of the underlying bugs that were introduced in that version. So um, in the top left corner, your clerk should be able to click the little hamburger menu and see something called the envelope lookup. The intent behind that feature is to be commensurate with that all active filing search that was previously available in Silverlight. Um, if it's something different that they were doing, some other report they were running, I don't mind. If, I, I don't mind if you reach out to me and we can see um, we can get a little more information on what steps she was uh, performing to see if we do uh, if that was the envelope lookup action that um, or the all active filings and the envelope lookup. Uh, feature that we've just added will satisfy that, or if there's something else that we need to we need to provide some workaround steps uh, to to get you guys back was, to where you need to be. Sorry about that. Um, what she was saying was that she was opening an individual case, opening the cause number, and she used to be able to see everything that was filed, including the things that had been filed and not yet even seen by the clerks. So this is the the judge and the coordinator doing a last minute check. Or, for example, if we're in a hearing and one of the lawyers says, well, I submitted my brief half an hour ago, then she could just jump into e-file and get it. And she said that authority to see the history in e-file and the pending documents that have not yet been seen by the clerk are no longer accessible to her. And so we can do nothing when they say they filed it other than say, would you email me a copy or call the clerk who's watching on YouTube and ask them to go ahead and check pending, accept it, and then put it in my queue. And that, that is unwieldy when you're mowing through 80 cases on a, a four hour docket. So that's what I'm saying, not the clerk reports, but mm -hmm. the coordinator of opening a file to see the history and the not yet reviewed submissions. Okay, so what what I'd like to do is is get a little bit more information on the process they're doing to see and see it firsthand. So uh, what I can do is I can put my email address uh, in the chat, and you can provide it to your coordinator and have them reach out to me. And I'd like to get a little more information to to see uh, what's going on and, and and help her out and point her in the right direction. That was not an intentional change. That's that's some kind of a change in the process through the recent upgrade that is different from before. Unintentional. Okay. Okay. So that's what I'm asking. Yes. I think the answer is yes. Okay. Yep. I couldn't hear yeah. the Thank you. Okay. Uh, would you like to, move, should we move on to the, the next slide? Yep. Yes. Okay. So a quick update on eFile Texas 2.0. Um, as you can see from the slide, we're actually starting to overlap some of our cycles. If, if you were in attendance in the uh, early kickoff meeting, we did say that this was essentially how the, the implementation would uh, proceed, is that we would have overlapping cycles, and the intent was to front load a lot of our analysis and design on our, our requirements and, and new development features that are going into the 2.0 uh, project. So. On the left-hand side, cycle one, the execution phase is about 68% complete with our, our develop, solution development during this phase around 62%. Uh, during this time, we've actually already kicked off our initial testing phase, which is 58% complete. And that represents our first round of user acceptance testing for our items that are marked as out of the box requirements. Uh, and our um, OCA SMEs are actually beginning their second round uh, of testing. Additionally, our, our e-file analytics pilot testing is about 78% or 75% complete. And so far we've actually received a overwhelmingly positive feedback. Um, uh, we're hoping that if all things uh, go well and, and testing can complete on time, we think we should be able to have that available to, to um, the larger body of clerks uh, by hopefully the end of the year. And for cycle two, our analysis, does, our, analysis is, our analysis and design is complete and we're actually scheduled to begin the development of our cycle two features on uh, December 20th, just before we hit the holidays. And as a reminder, some of those notable features in cycle two are composable security model, 
um, multi-factor authentication, in-app push notifications, and our, our enhanced return for correction process. And lastly, we'll actually be beginning our cycle three analysis and design. Uh, the first session of our, our, our design session starts on uh, November 17th. And lastly, uh, some a research uh, Texas update. Uh, our user growth was, uh, our new user growth was only about 1.5%, uh, but the actual growth of attorney users was, was around 6.5%. Uh, additionally, we've had uh, six, during this time uh, since our last meeting, we've actually had six new counties uh, ask for the inclusion of, of criminal records, which is actually consistent with our legal professional community where the number one request is, you know, when will we be able to get our hands on, on criminal data? Follow closely by when we'll be getting uh, judgments and orders available to us, um, and that that la that second uh, question actually speaks more to the the integration status. And right now, we have about six percent of the courts that are that are integrated, but we're hoping that the UCMS project uh, could help increase the number of our integrated courts. And lastly, in the in the last meeting, it was asked that we provide. Uh, the document, a breakdown of the document purchase revenue, which you can see in the, the bottom right hand slide, right, bottom right hand uh, portion of the slide. Um, on average, we're seeing that the integrated courts are, are getting about $2,400 uh, per court, and our non integrated courts are at about $400 per court. Any questions? So I've got a question for Casey. Are you effectively you're the manager of the contract? Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with the progress they're making on the fixes and the move? Yeah, I am. I am well, on the e-file two side of things. Uh, we definitely are. We actually have a project manager at OCA. His name is uh, Sam Lavaria, who's managing it from a purely project management standpoint. And him and Evan meet whatever two three times a week. Yeah, it's, yep. they're almost constantly, you know, pushing where are we with this, we need to slide this here, um, or we need to get in touch with whoever or, or those kinds of things. So, yeah, it's, well, it's moving along. Those of us who work in IT know this is the process. You put something new in, you've got to go through a process, you've got to do user acceptance, you have to train right. which like, you know, functional requirements you thought you could do, and then you need to modify them. Right. And so you best know if we're meeting those requirements. Yep. Um, and that's why I wanted to ask you that question. I understand individual users may have things that they're saying, this is missing, it's inconvenient because I have to flip back and forth. Sure. And I appreciate that y'all are working toward, you know, getting everything moved over, but I know it's not like buying a new car, you know, just right. go in and buy the way it is, you have to make it work. I will say that this e-file, the e-file two contract, is a lot more, I, I call it formal than the original, because you'll remember yeah. when we originally did e-filing, I would say that the judiciary was under duress when it happened. And so it was, we had to go because there was no other op, you know, it was a bad situation. This time, you know, with the contract we've given them, here's your laundry list of 15 bazillion requirements. And they went through and said, we think these we do out of the box. Um, we spent time at OCA saying, I agree that you're already doing this, so let's not worry about that. But then everything that didn't score that, we had them put it into one of the three or one of the four phases. And now with the analysis and design, usually it's um, myself, um, Sherry Woodfin, some of our other people that know court processes. And we sit down and talk with Tyler because they'll say, well, what do you mean by this? And then Sherry will say, no, the clerks say it's got to be like this. Oh, okay, man, we get it. And so that whole process takes place, which um, we didn't have that luxury on any file one that we do this time. So I'm, and I'm satisfied that we're making the, the progress that they've set out on the timeline. So, okay. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I know that there are going to be little things as you migrate over. My, my next question is for Edward, maybe Terry, I'm not sure. How does our e-filing 2.0 functional deliverable system compare to your other states or jurisdictions that may be using your platform or our functions in line with other jurisdictions or are we still 
out there hacking through the jungle, blazing territory that nobody else has run into before. Yeah, I can I can answer that and then maybe provide Evan with an opportunity to as well since he's running the 2.0 project. Um, most of the requirements that we had in eFile 2.0 for Texas uh, were commensurate with the direction that we wanted to take the product. And I would say probably about 90% uh, of the stuff that was included in there as functional requirements were things that we wanted to do. Uh, and now that just really kind of um, aligned us with our direction with uh, the OCA and um, this specific project. So that's a good thing. I'd say about 80% of that is, is items that would benefit the entire e-filing community, not just Texas, but the other 25 states that we serve. So um, a lot of what we were uh, planning to do are now requirements of the project. So we were already moving in that direction, but that alignment uh, just further um, uh, reinforced that we were moving in the right direction with the things and the uh, features and the functions uh, and the enhancements to the solution uh, that the state was, was desiring. So um, I'd say that uh, for the most part, there's a lot of overlap across the states and with the functionality that we're building uh, with this new project. Um, there's always going to be those nuances uh, in those states that maybe have different processes that, uh, that require different functionality. Uh, and, and Evan spoke a little bit about that with regards to feature parity. There's some items in our Silverlight review tool that uh, really are only used by one jurisdiction across the 1,500 uh, plus jurisdictions that we serve across the country. So those are some of the things that are maybe a little further delayed, but, but in general speaking, um, I'd say the vast majority of the new enhancements in the new project are commensurate with uh, needs of other courts across the country. I, I would add to that too, that I think generally speaking, the e-file system is the same way that textbooks work. Texas says we're going this way and here's the standard and most other states will say, yeah, that works for us too. We'll just take that. Yeah, and, and continue. I'm sensitive, I'm sensitive to users being impatient or having to go through change. I think I'm hearing from, from the participants who are part of the course using the tool that they've got you know concerns that I haven't heard an uproar just let's get these things fixed. I think you've set a good direction there. I appreciate that. I, I, I think both sides are kind of you know, both the users and the builders of the system are working toward a common goal, and I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure everybody was in agreement on that. We don't want to find out in March, oh my God, we expressed concern way back in November, no one listened to us. It doesn't sound like that's what's happening. It sounds like everybody's satisfied. We're making progress. So. And, and from the from the actual kind of nuts and bolts project perspective, that's something that that Sam and I have both um, taken into account whenever whenever we set up our, our user testing groups, we wanted to get um, a, a good sample set of either, you know, more experienced attorneys, less experienced attorneys. Um, so we can kind of get feedback from different user perspectives to make sure that we're capturing uh, the most good that we can from uh from a feature and how it how it operates whenever we hit the user acceptance testing. As far as um even going even before that, when we're still in the design analysis phase, what Terry had alluded to on the previous slide that that we have a we have a, a, a team that's overseeing the kind of the, the product evolution as a whole and um, listening to the feedback we're getting from our, our user communities and making those right user uh, or those right user experience adjustments. This same group we're actually tapping into whenever we do these design sessions. So that way um, they can look at a particular feature and say, okay, this is very much, you know, Texas specific and we could design it in a way that, that meets Texas requirements, Texas goals, but allow the flexibility to make some, some fine tuning, some tweaks for other jurisdictions that are outside of Texas. So we're, we're taking a lot of that into account and, and where we can't um, build it strictly into the feature, we're trying to tackle it with uh, having it flexible enough that configuration can kind of handle some of those other, other edge cases in other jurisdictions. Okay, well, that, that wraps up my portion. If there are no other questions, I'll, I'll return the floor to, to Casey. Thank you, Evan.
Are we done? I think we're done. Okay. UCMS. Okay, Evan, you can say stop sharing screen. There you go. Uh, UCMS. So um, at our last meeting, uh, we spoke about how OCA uh, has engaged in three different vendors in UCMS. I can't remember if I said that last time or not. That was August. So we may have been right about to sign a contract if we haven't. Um, but OCA has contracted with three different vendors, um, Tyler Technologies, iDocket, and iCon out of Georgia uh, to provide case management system for counties with a population of 20,000 or less. Um, in this require the requirements of this project, it has to be fully integrated with e-filing, has to be fully integrated with research and has to be able to do the, the nightly batch loading to DPS, which we know that there are some clerks that are, that are in the rural counties that aren't integrated that still have to key stuff into DPS system. And so we're hopeful this will uh, help that. Um, as of right now, um, two of the three vendors have an early adopter county that is either signed up or about to be signed up. And then um, one of them is still working on it. Hold on a second. And so um, we, we've got lists of counties that are starting to come onto this project. So we expect that um, right now it's looking like OCA will run out of money, which is a good thing. And so it was not what we were expecting. I was expecting I would get a couple to jump on and it would be a good project. But I wasn't expecting to have to go to the legislature and say we need more money for this wildly successful program. Um, so how many counties or courts would that bring? Uh, right, right now, I think the, the listing, the rough listing of people that are remotely interested, you're talking 20 to 30. And so it's, it's a significant list of a group of counties. Um, and that's with two of the three vendors going full bore right now, and the third one is still ramping up. So they're all 20,000 or less? Or? Yes. Okay. So um, we're excited about that. And, and uh, David Greeno is another one of our project managers is working on that. And he's actually working with all three vendors, um, getting their early adopter county stood up. And we expect those to be done within the six, next six to nine months. And then after that, we'll just be rolling on more counties as those three vendors sign people up um, for that tool. So sure. very, very exciting stuff. That is. Anything else? And that's all I've got on that one. Okay, we're going to move into our subcommittee updates. First one is standards. Casey previously sent you a draft from the standards committee recommendation for standard 7.0. A significant portion of that update uh, is in response to Senate Bill 41, which is generally referred to as the consolidation of fees legislation. And open the floor, Casey. Do you want to anything that you want to add before we sure? So break it up. Um, as you all recall, the process is generally the counties and other people email us saying, "Hey, I need these changes to the standards." Um, the committee actually had met back in March and gone through that list and had made some decisions on things, and those are reflected in, in the copy that I sent you. Um, but what Bob says is absolutely right. The main focus is. With uh, Senate Bill 41, there were some changes to things that, as of January 1st, there's some additional services that aren't, that are going away. Um, and then there's a lot of things to where it was um, dependent on whether or not there was a, a child involved in the case. So, like I know, declare marriage void, we didn't have one that said declare marriage void with, with children. And so the fees are different. And so those are the big adjustments uh, that we made in this. Uh, version. John, Tracy, do y'all have any additional comments or concerns? I know you and your staffs have been through this pretty thoroughly, so. Right. Okay. Any of our Zoom folks have any questions or comments, concerns you'd like to talk about?
Just anything in chat? Mm -hmm. Yep. I think we're good. I think you're ready to entertain a motion. All right. Anybody care to make a motion that we adopt version seven of the standards? Start on the Okay, Dennis moves, second. John? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay, they're adopted. Thank you very much. Let's see. Next is the cybersecurity. Cybersecurity presentation. Discussion. And it's, uh, what we, we, we looked at the survey results and, and we've kind of uh, uh, done some presentations and some public uh, interaction. Uh, we did a presentation of a while back. At this point, the results of the survey suggest that most of our courts are relying on someone within their area to provide their cybersecurity protection, whether it's a county uh, or whether it's uh, the, the state agencies in the DIR or someone like that. What, what we, we haven't come down to is how much authority we can impose to say, look, we think Supreme Court, you should adopt these standards because we probably going to be stepping on some other, uh, other branches of the U.S. government that takes us and telling uh, people how they have to organize their information. What we would like to do, though, is probably consider more uh, security awareness, direct training. We think that's something that the Supreme Court and the NCA can work on. In particular, the, the threat to most of our courts, in my opinion, is still fishing. That this is where the threats are coming. It's coming in through email. Individuals are clicking on things, thinking it's Legitimate, I see a message. Oh, this is from Judge Smith. I better click on it and do what he says. And it's not Judge Smith, it's some guy in Poland who's trying to trick you. And their effort or their goal is to take over your computer or your system in some way um, in order to, you know, either pose a ransomware attack on you or maybe use your computer just as a, a zombie in a big attack on somebody else. You know, and we want to train our, you know, employees in, in courts all over the state to resist those moves. This is a common problem in my place of business. I don't work in a court. I work for a law firm. But just this week, it is one of our employees saw an email from a partner. These are the people who own our firm. And she quickly did what he asked. And inadvertently, she was serving as an aid to an outside hacker trying to gamble information. But we don't expect there to be any, any harm from it, but it's the, kind of, it's the kind of behavior we really have to rely on the people who own those email accounts to be our first line of defense. Every organization has to rely on everyone to do some scrutiny. If you see an email from your, from your county, but it ends in .com, and you know you're your county is not a commercial business, and that's not the email domain. Everyone needs to scrutinize those addresses in the UK. But we probably need to engage in some more phishing testing and some security awareness training. There is a risk if the Supreme Court asks Casey to start phishing our courts, effectively, he's, he's performing a hacking act. He's not doing it for nefarious purposes. He's doing it for the training. But we need some higher permission for someone in the OCA to send an email saying, hey, I'm the governor. Please click this link to you know, get free money because you're effectively lying. And we, we need to know that that's something we can get away with. I don't think we'll have any trouble with that. But I know from experience, if you start combining commercial companies or real legitimate people who are not in on the gig, they will object vociferously. And some of the users may not use the tools to ask, is this legitimate? They may go back to the source and say, hey, Governor Abbott, did you send this to me? And he will say, oh my God, someone is masquerading as me. So we have to be careful how we construct such a crime. <laughs> <laughs> 
It, it's, so you need the governor's permission to be part of that. Uh, it, correct. Uh, it, <laughs> you would need the permission of any commercial business. If you pretend you're Chase Bank, Chase Bank is not going to be happy that you're masquerading as them. It would be that way with anyone. And, and, and there are some things that I think we need to consider. But I believe this is an important next step because not every county or jurisdiction or court even has the wherewithal to do that. Casey, you've been doing some fishing inside your own agency. Yes. And it's fun. <laughs> I like to take the boat out just as much as everybody else. Um, but I, to build on your point, Dennis, I do think one of the other things that we can be doing is pushing counties to use the resources that they have available to yes. them. Um, I know that the, uh, the multi-state information, MSI SAC, I don't even know what it stands for, but they're the security group that Homeland Security puts on and they have free fishing resources that all it takes is for the county IT or court IT to reach out to them and join, which is like three signatures away. There's no money involved. And then all of a sudden you have access to a bunch of uh, no cost tools that allow you to, to do a, a very quick fishing expedition to see where you are and to see where your weakest links are. Is, is the training in the state universal? I remember you know, in Travis County every six months I've got to be online with the certification that I've taken the latest IT cybersecurity course. Uh, and they follow up. I mean, it's all kept on who's, you know, I, I, as a department head, I would get a list of here's who's not compliant. And I'd go make the rounds and make certain they did it. Is that a standard around the state or is that unique? Um, I believe the the last couple of sessions ago, they, they did pass a law making that a standard. And it was for annual training for anybody who, um, it doesn't matter what level of government you're in. If you're a government employee, local, state, federal, doesn't matter. That if more than 25% of your job was done on a computer, which is pretty much everybody, right. um, then you're required to take that annual training. And so, like for OCA, for the, all the courts that we support directly, we have to sign off annually to the Department of Information Resources saying we gave out training and we certify that everybody took it. And uh, we do the same thing. We send out reports to the chiefs or the executive directors that can say, look, You've got these people that haven't taken their training. Um, if they don't have it done by such and such a date, we're going to turn off their account and then we'll turn it back on once they take training. Usually that kind of gets people in compliance. Um, and then we also do the, the, the bit when we do go out fishing and um, when anybody does click on that link because of the way the phishing software is set up, it immediately tells them you've been fished and assigns them some remedial training to go through to, to say, this is what you should have spotted. Um, and the other thing that we had the flexibility of doing is increasing the difficulty. Our first one that we did was just a notice from DHL that said, dear user, you have a package. We need to verify your details. <laughs> Easy. Um, but, the, but we have all the flexibility in the world. So I can do what you said, Dennis, and send an email from Nathan Hecht and it'll be, you know, chief judge 1728 at gmail.com, but it'll say, I'm, you know, as the chief justice of the Supreme Court, I need you to do this, this, and this. And I think you will absolutely catch a lot more people. Right. Uh, in, 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 in my law firm, uh, the one fish that I did that got me in the most hot water was when I sent a message from someone called the attorney review saying, we have a complaint against you. Click this link to learn about it. Holy crap. Uh, a lot of them fell for it, and they did not like that at all. But there was a fishing campaign going on at that very moment against attorneys. It wasn't directed directly at Texas, but it was all over, and we felt we were justified because our attorneys and our end users are our first line of defense. Listen, whatever y'all saw on CSI or any movie you saw about cybersecurity, there is no appliance that Bill Gates sells that you plug in and you're safe. It doesn't exist. The end user, the person using the computer, the person on the keyboard gets to decide first, do I let this in or not? And we've got an open door. We've effectively built a castle. And instead of one big drawbridge with guys with spears and arrows, we have built 
thousands of tiny draw bridges, and a lot of people can let the bad guys in. And so we have to train those people first. That's our best line of defense is to educate the people who run those little draw bridges in the form of their personal outlook account. I, I think that's crucial. And, and anything else you do beyond that may fail because uh, if you've got people constantly letting in the bad guy, you're going to have a hard time. It's difficult. Uh, so I, I think that's where this committee want to focus uh, our efforts. Uh, Judge Hind, I, I don't know if you want to add anything. I, I jumped in the front, started speaking, but we had talked about whether we have any initiatives or special things. After reviewing those surveys, I'm afraid hard, hard posted directives or rules may not carry as much weight, except to say, you know what, here's a minimum standard. We think everybody should achieve this. And if it's published, so much the better. But in particular, we really want to help with this user training because they are the first line of defense. Oh, yeah. And I agree with everything Dennis says when it comes to IT, regardless. Um, and uh, I think he's right on uh, on point on those things. The, the couple thoughts I have are, um, <clears throat> one, you know, we talked about this and we just it, we haven't really reached out, but I think we should be reaching out to the Texas Center for the Judiciary and the District and County Clerks Association and asking them if they would please give us, you know, 10 minutes at every one of their continuing education conferences to, to just do the training for the judges and the clerks themselves. Uh, it's one thing for the deputy clerks and the court staff. There's, you know, an employment relationship there where, um, you know, there's, there's some authority there. But for the elected officials themselves, you know, you've got to work through some personality issues sometimes. And so if we can do something with those associations, whether it's just give us 10 minutes or let us be the filler information that goes on the, the slideshow in between sessions that the slideshow is always showing, you know, you can, you know, we can put stuff together on that um, so that it's just, it's, it's, it's something that's always there they're thinking about. Um, you know, one other piece, um, you know, we've talked about, and this again would be something we'd probably reach out to the Texas Association of District Judges. But, uh, you know, one of the areas where we think there could be some, the judges could have a, a, a bigger impact, not just for the courts, but for county governments in general, is the selection of the county auditor, which the district court uh, is empowered to appoint the county auditor. And so educating the district judges on the importance of uh, screening the county auditors and making sure, you know, uh, an IT component to their audit is part of their um, scope of work uh, would be useful. And that, that, again, is one of those kind of education things, educating the district judges in particular on that front. And then, you know, the only other thing I would, I would lobby a little bit more for OCA to be involved at least on some of the, um, what we're calling the, the fishing exercises, at least those directed at the judges, uh, because we do have, we do have some separation of powers things to keep in mind here and some politics, frankly, um, you know, um, want judges to be able to be um, educated and frankly, they can be some of the most vulnerable users. Uh, we want to do it in a way where they feel like they aren't going to be politically burned uh, or that, you know, it's the executive branch or the legislative branch um, intruding on the judicial branch. And so I think OCA would be um, well positioned to play a role there since it's part of the judicial branch um, and it already has a lot of um, responsibilities and training and administrative work, but that may be an area um, where we uh, can address that nuance. I can just imagine um, judges 
overreacting to, you know, if they, if they fail a fishing test, you know, oh my gosh, if my state rep and my state senator hear about this, then they're going to primary me. Or, you know, why is the legislature trying to um, hack into my computer system? You know, you can think of various conspiracies. And so that may build resistance to, um, you know, clients in terms of going along with the education system. Whereas if it comes through the judiciary, through the OCA, um, there's a little bit more confidence that this is what happens to the judiciary is going to stay in the judiciary on this front with the idea that we want people to, to engage in this training and, and to be receptive to constructive criticism rather than just defensive about it. So that, that, those would be what I would add to what Dennis is suggesting. Is, it, is that because is OCA, I imagine, Rule 12 and not the... Yes. Because, yeah, the reporter got hold of the results of right. any fishing next Well, and, and even then, DIR has... Hey, you're right. We're under Rule 12, not from the Public Information Act. But DIR has protections for... DIR, DIR does have protection. protections for things that, like... Security. I have a network diagram. Dennis, I'm sure you have a network diagram yeah. at your place. I mean, and anytime, uh, if the media came to those, say, can, those, can those you give me your network diagram? I say, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> those, because, yeah, that's a map to the kingdom. It's a roadmap for how a hacker can get in. You don't want that to be published in Czechoslovakia or Poland or wherever the hackers are coming from. Right. What obscure it They don't need an open record request unless so it's hacking to get it. Yeah, that's going to get yeah. it. Thanks, Dennis and Judge Hyam. Could you all, for the next meeting, draft a specific recommendation or action steps you'd like to see us slash OCA take that then they could run up the chain, perhaps to the presiding judges of the of the of the regions or, or whomever? Sure. To get, to get some, reaction. Some ideas from here. Casey's idea about using the MSI style is great, uh, but uh, I, I think. Uh, Judge Hines' idea of specifically asking for uh, help for the judges will, will be a great aid because as the judges go, it's going to be much easier to get all of the other court members to follow along. Um, if, if, if they're not part of it, then some of the clerk staff may say, yeah, I'll get around to it. It's not important. The judge doesn't see it as important. If we yeah. can get everyone to go, then I think it'll be a lot better. Okay, if you could bring that back to us for the for the next meeting, and we can move move that ahead. All right, orders subcommittee. So that's uh, uh, Carlos and Todd. Hi, thank you. And uh, Todd, please jump in, and and anybody else who's on the subcommittee as well. Uh, let me kind of start at kind of a high level, and then I'll kind of go into a little bit of the work we've been doing. We had several. Uh, meetings and we've had some um, work towards getting concrete proposals for, for this committee. Um, there's two aspects to what we are, are, are doing. The first is sort of the process flow, uh, the technological aspects of it. And I think that there's a, there may be an update with regard to Tyler uh, on that point, if I understand uh, from, from Casey, uh, but, but maybe not. Uh, and secondly, and we're going to have hopefully a, a, a sort of best practices type process flow, hopefully, that we're going to be putting together over the next uh, bit of time that the subcommittee is working. The second part has to do with a rule uh, proposal or multiple rule proposals on how exactly we get um, actually the orders loaded up on uh, for e-filing, for e-service to be up on the system and to be up on research. And so the first item that we looked into is, can we have, or that was the subcommittee was proposing, and I think we have tentatively possibly a positive answer, which is, can we have a signed orders queue? Because right now it's very confusing when in the, in the file, there's a bunch of proposed orders that are filed and they have certificate of services. There's a series of, of technological um, issues that, that may be slowing down the process of trying to get the actual signed orders uh, online. And so that that's one thing that we talked about. And the question really, and this is a question for research for Tyler is, you know, can we can we create a signed orders queue so that once the judge signs, 
it can immediately be um, queued up for for the clerks to stamp and and process through. Um, and and Terry, I see that you unmuted. I don't know if you wanted to answer or if you want me to keep going. But if you want to go ahead, go ahead. It just just a short response to that. Absolutely, that's definitely something that we can we can set up and configure and work through that workflow. Um, it would be by jurisdiction and even by court. So by the by the how we would handle that. But short answer is yes, and and we'd love to work on that. Great. And so, and, and then the, the next part I'd say is we're fortunate to have a, a number of clerks on the subcommittee from very large jurisdictions and from jurisdictions that are not as large, but uh, they've shared different process flows and it's been very collaborative, very helpful. I think it's it's been enlightening to people like me that didn't understand all of the process that was going on. Um, and we're going to continue to do that and hopefully have something to present to the committee more robustly uh, in the future. With regards to rule revisions, just to kind of outline where we're at, we're not ready to share a proposed rule yet, but I think just to let to report to the general committee, we've been working on a draft of a proposed new rule that would be for filing and distributions of orders generally. In other words, that upon signing the order that things that must be done by the court or by the clerk or by other parties. And so there's still a lot to be worked out there, but we, we have uh, some drafts that we're working through. Then I'd also say that we have three other rules that we noted in this process that we may make a suggestion to the Supreme Court Advisory Committee or the Rules Committee or another group, which are Rule 26 pertaining to the clerk maintaining the court's docket, Rule uh, 297 uh, pertaining to findings of facts and conclusions of law that the court shall fi file, and uh, thirdly, uh, 306A3 with regards to notice of judgments. Uh, these are all, uh, and I appreciate Judge Hind helping me out and finding out some of the rules that were similar to what we were trying to do, um, but pr providing mechanisms that the court is already uh, effectively filing or providing uh, information that is required to under the rules. So that's a short summary of some of what we've been up to. The last thing I'd note is uh, I would echo what, what Judge Hines said in connection with the cybersecurity context, and we had some discussions about it in our subcommittee, which is uh, to the extent that we can uh, be a complement and, and help with uh, some of the organizations statewide for the district court or county court staffs, as well as some of the judiciary, uh, whether it's at CLEs or other things like that, it, it may help um, with kind of the general uh, process of getting this standardized throughout the state and making orders available online for everybody. Um, last point I'd make, and then I'll turn it over to Todd, is uh, there's a case that the Supreme Court uh, issued last month where apparently it had been four months between the time that a, the, court, the court order issued and the parties were aware of it. And um, I don't think that's typical at all. I think that courts are and, and clerk very diligent typically in getting orders to, to the litigants, but it happens from time to time. And so it's really important for a number of reasons that, that to the extent we can expedite the process of signed orders being available uh, electronically and online, that's something that I think will be valuable to members of the bar um, and, and the public. So that's my report. Yeah, and I don't really have uh, much to add to that. I think Carlos accurately covered the, the state of affairs on the order subcommittee. Uh, I did note uh, during the Tyler report that uh, the second most commonly asked question by the legal professionals using Research Texas is when orders are going to be available. So this is you know, something that we absolutely have to address. And I'm, I'm pleased that our committee, our subcommittee is uh, working diligently on how to approach this issue. And we look forward to, to bringing some ideas back to the full committee for deliberation. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any questions or additional comments regarding orders and the work of the subcommittee? Okay, if not, then new business. I can take the first one, Bob. You want to take that? Sure. So, um, currently in Research Texas, you all are aware that um, the way the pricing structure is set up, it's, and Tracy, tell me if I'm wrong. It, the current structure is 10 cents a page. 
with a maximum of six dollars. Yes, in research. Yes. So keep that in the back of your head. Ten cents a page with a max of six dollars. Um, with the passage of Senate Bill Forty One, they split out copy fees based on the original document and what you're distributing as. So going from paper to electronic is a dollar a page. Paper to paper is a dollar a page. If you have a file that's electronic and you're giving it out electronic, kind of like what we're doing with research, the fee structure in Senate Bill 41 is $1 minimum and then 10 cents a page after 10 pages. So that leads to a little bit of disparity because if you have a six page document, if you go to the county, it's a dollar because it's a dollar minimum. If you go to research, it's 60 cents. And then the flip side is if you get a 50 page document or let's say a hundred page document on research, it's dollars, but on the county, it's gonna be a little bit more than $6. And so I think the, the question here is, do we want to synchronize so that that uh, what research is charging is the same thing that is being charged in SB 41? But we can't do it until SB 41 that we're just going to charge this. So I, I guess that's, that's the point, and, and we recommend it. I think the committee recommended it. Right, and the Standards Committee be recommended that we that be consistent so is there um i noticed during evan's presentation he, he showed what research texas revenue was i guess that's over the last quarter i don't know what the period was is there a way to apply the synchronization to the past behavior in research to see what the net revenue difference is this is not going to produce millions of dollars do no, I don't think so. Evan, do you, or Evan or Terry, do you know off the top of your head, do we have the ability to see past research transactions and the number of pages that they were? Yeah, we should be able to pull that. So we can find that out if we need to, Dennis. I think, I mean, it's not I think my, able to synchronize it. My question is, is that if, if we say we should propose to the Supreme Court that we synchronize it, then we can do it in a way that on January 1st, when it hits, that it hits and we're not out of sync. Well, we can demonstrate that it doesn't substantially, radically change the whole revenue model, and there's no reason not to do it. And I, I think that they would be very willing to do it, but there's still a question. Well, well Dennis, the other side is how, how do we justify doing something different for, for documents that in fact are the same documents other than the source? And be different from what the legislature just enacted. Yeah, that whole thing. The, the, the two and then explain that. that. And, 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 and then explain that. Is there not like usually in these? In, I've seen this, this legislation, but usually in the legislation of charging there has to be related to what the cost of providing the services is. So it's just that set amount. It, the way it's so said is that justification. Right. We got to also. The way it's said is it's. Copies for a copy of something. If it started in paper and you're giving it in paper, it's a dollar a page. If it started in paper and you're giving it in electronic, it's a dollar a page. And okay. then everything else is this. Um, that also creates issues in that, like I know John doesn't charge anything for copies. And so now he's got to go talk to his county attorney to see if they're going to violate law and continue to get things out for free or if they're going to start charging things. Because it no longer says up to, it says this is the charge. I think, and yeah, we, I agree, we will have to have some clarification because it says this is the charge. Does not mean if you're going to charge or this is the charge regardless? I mean, so you, you have uh, you have those litigants who cannot yeah, have a constitutional pay. provision you've got to watch for if it doesn't give you that. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, I think that's a conversation that you have to have. But in the event that John says, Yes, we have to charge, then that fee is set. There is no leeway on what that fee is. I was just worried if we were going to raise, that we didn't have to also justify by saying, because we're doing the same thing, we're not doing anything different. I'll just raise the charge. And now we get to say it's because of the legislature. 
Right. It's in bill, but, Senate Bill 41. But, but, I, but I don't think research included is included in Senate Bill 41. I would hope it's, it's for copies. It's whether you're giving the copies or we're giving the copies. But uh, works for me. But how is it possible to direct us to require to charge someone a fee unless it's a fee that actually goes to the state? Legislature can. And a county's trouble in it, your worst subdivision of the state. Right. But can John yeah. then pay that fee on behalf of the citizen himself? Sure. What money? But I mean, that would be certain. The money that he gathered from it. The last person gave him a dime, so he took that dime. There's a constitutional provision, Article 17, and the Constitution, Article 3, Section 17, that it's unconstitutional to give anything for free. You're doing it now. I think that that problem might, yeah. might exist, but now in the face of the statute, if it is a charge, he says you have to charge, and he's not as clear. So it seems like folks who don't have the means we handle like we do now, if the, if they're a pauper, if I was a pauper, so it's incentive to send them to put that one. Yeah, that's about pauper. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's that, that's how we're doing it now, and I don't know that this changes any of that. All we're recommending at this point is just syncing up the fee amounts in the way they are charged. What 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 Tracy's selling for the same price is the official record, right? We, we no, it's, it's it's the same it's copy that I have. Right. Yeah. But research has the same copy that she has. But you're talking about certification. certification. So certified copies is different. There's it's another different. five dollars on that. Only Tracy right. can sell that. I imagine there's a difference from digital to digital, where you're, you're asking for. You've got a system to set up. You can't copy it unless there's you know, some kind of process to come through. Where John just had it's just up there public on the web, and anyone can get it. Get brand. And I don't think you're giving anything away, just you set up your system is all public and they can you can't control whether they're it right or not. But if you've got a system where they you know have to go through to buy it, then you now it sounds like you've got to charge it. Right. But so I guess the question is, is Dennis, to your point, if Tracy and I both have a copy of the same document and Tracy gets the money if she sells it, and Tracy also gets the money if I sell it, would it be nice to have the price be the same or or else it'll do sales. Yeah. Right. And the person paying for it is paying the same regardless of which route they take. Right. It makes sense. How or is that only if the court that has it has it in paper form? I, I don't think I think that's all based on the clerks. They're yeah. the ones to say as far as, as far as paper charge. Yeah, how do you know if, if I request a record, how do I know if it was in paper form and delivered digitally, there's a different price than if it's just digital. Okay. Yes. I, I think that's where the if it's if a clerk is in a paper environment <clears throat> and you are physically um, touching that paper and converting it to a digital image or making a copy, that's Kind of labor, so it's a one dollar for the first page and uh, ten cents for each additional page. So no, that's, no, that's no. kind of for paper, it's a paper to paper. Is a dollar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so but it's, you're it's, saying that that's so that would be pre file Texas. Yes, correct. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. And and, 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 and and for me, the reason why I don't charge is because all of ours are in, in uh, electronic format, and it's literally just a matter of clicking, um, attaching a document to send. I mean. I, I just don't. I just don't see how it's reasonable to charge somebody for something that really requires no effort. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that comes out yeah. as you all work that through. Okay. Any other discussion? So do you want to? Yeah. Make that a hard recommendation. Yeah. Would somebody like to move formally that we recommend that these charges be the same between research? And what's provided for in Senate Bill 41? I will move at for consistency sake 
we make the charges the same as it relates to Senate Bill 41 and e -conferences. Thank you. This is Rebecca, and I'll make the second. Thank you. Hey, Justice, how are you? I'm fine. I'm here under my daughter's name because she played with my phone before I got on the Zoom. So if you see Rachel Clemens, that's, this is Rebecca. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Okay. Um, the next one is a certificate of service, right? On the automated certificate of service and and Justice Simmons, you may want to speak to this because I know that um, Blake had said something about this as well. I know that some of the clerks have brought up the issue with um, okay. proposed orders. Is that right, Tracy? Sure. And so I'm going to quote the issue and then tell me if I'm wrong. But in the event a filer files a proposed order, the automated certificate of services attached to the proposed order goes to the judge they sign it, and then depending on how the clerk's office processes it, they don't take that sheet off manually, then now you've got a signed order with the certificate of service from the proposed order, and now a new certificate of service from the actual order. Is that correct? Well, it's just gonna look like the order was already served. Served when it really wasn't. And so I think from the clerk's standpoint, they were saying that uh, it would be nice if we could turn the, the certificate of service off just for the filing type of proposed orders. I think we've got agreement that everybody's okay with it everywhere else. Other than that. And so Justice Simmons, I know Blake had uh, some issues with that. Do you remember what those issues were around? Uh, my thought was that he was talking about um, trying to understand why this is coming up because when typically when a proposed order is submitted, some type of motion, I, I think is what he's used to is there's some kind of cover sheet on that proposed order so that that's not getting file stamped. And maybe that's what he had in mind. I mean, I think he just wanted to look at it a little closer because it just seemed like there should be a super easy fix. And this might be the super easy fix. Um, I'm not sure I understood that we could end up just turning off. And if you turn off the proposed order, how do you know when the proposed order was filed? I guess that's kind of the question I'd like to know is then if we turn off the certificate of service on proposed orders, when do we know, or how do we know that the proposed order was served on all council, et cetera? And maybe I just need more information, and I think, you know, we all do, really. Right, I think, and, and Terry or Evan can jump in if I'm wrong, but you can go to the filing history to see um, who's been served on that at any point in time, so that you would know that that proposed order has been served. And I, and I will say that that functionality to remove that certificate of service I believe, is that phase two or three, Evan? Do you remember which phase it's in? Where we <clears throat> where we swapped out that with uh, something else. Right. That's gonna be in cycle two, yes. So we're still several months off, Judge, of having that available in, in e-file, but we do have a plan so that we could, if, if the recommendation was turn off the automated certificate of service for proposed orders, we could certainly do that. Okay. So let me ask you this, though. If the rules require everybody to do a certificate of service for a filing, then how do you work that, work around that? Or do we need to? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, Kate, this... Casey, can I, can I chime in here? Sure. Yeah. Um, this is Sion. Um, first of all, there was some discussion at one of the last meetings that this automated certificate of service is changing the document that's filed. Um, I, I don't think it changes it any more than a clerk's stamp on the front, front of the document changes it. I mean, every time a clerk stamps a document received or filed or anything else, they're changing that document. So if we all understand 
that this certificate is being generated by the filing itself, then it doesn't change it any more than that stamp that the clerks put on it in the first place. Secondly, as far as there was also some discussion about changing the rules to no longer require a certificate of service, but I don't think that should be done. That certificate of service is a requirement of the filer to say, I did this versus this electronic attachment, which I personally like them both. This electronic attachment says you really did or you didn't do what you said you did. And, and that's different. The burden there is on different entities. And I like having them both there. And I'm not sure we should alleviate that burden on the filer to not have to say, yes, I did do this. But I don't, I don't see why there's an issue about turning this on and off uh, when it doesn't change it any more than a file stamp does. Uh, this is Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, because um, I think I reached out to some folks about this after getting some back from one of the judges here in Harris County about this. Um, first, as for the rule, I would suggest that we get everything, all the kinks worked out on this before we start thinking about whether we need to recommend a rule change. Um, I think, you know, that's not something we have to really decide right now and maybe we you know we recommend that the rule not be changed but i would put that one on a back burner until we get all the kinks worked out on the on the um the solution you know a um i do recall blake sending an email maybe he just sent it to me i don't know but he said that you know he, he'd ask that JCIT not actually take any specific action since we couldn't be here today you know, but that he fully supported sending this to a subcommittee or something to study. Um, so I just want to make sure we remember that Blake was wanting to be involved in that discussion. But B, um, my understanding, at least, you know, my understanding is colored by the way we do e-filing and, you know, document management in the Harris County District Courts. What happens, I think, is when a proposed order is attached to a lead document, we don't seem to have this problem with the automated certificate of service being um, appended to the proposed order. It's when the um, proposed order itself is filed as a lead document or in those situations where someone doesn't break out the proposed order from the motion or response, and it's just the last two pages of the PDF of, of whatever they file, that's when you see it attached to the order. So there, you know, one solution would be, let's you know, consider turning off the automated certificate of service for proposed orders. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'd like to think about that because there are situations, I've had cases where you know, it mattered that one side or the other submitted the proposed order, and uh, it mattered to be able to say the other side knew what the proposing part or party was asking the court to do. And so there may be some situations where, you know, having kind of proof that this was served on the other side is important. Um, but the other thought, you know, I had is, you know, do we look at perhaps uh, allowing clerks to return for correction when a proposed order is filed as a lead document. Maybe that's the way to, to solve this. Um, you know, uh, if you're, if, if I, you know, I had a case a couple of weeks ago where the judge asked me to file a proposed order for a motion that had been previously filed. And so we filed it. Um, you know, maybe we go back to, you know, to make sure it's not a lead document. You, have a one page transmittal letter that's the lead document and attach the proposed order as attachment to that so that the certi automated certificate of service is attached to the transmittal letter and it's not appended to the proposed order. So that those are some, some thoughts and I'm open to other ideas, um, you know, but just um, that, that's kind of where, where I'm coming from on, on my thoughts on those. 
So, so one of our judges actually threw out also um, having another statement added on to that automated certificate of service to say something to the effect of if the preceding document is in order, please note the signed order was not served, only the proposed order. Having some kind of statement like that in the automated certificate so that we know if it was an order, it wasn't served. But I like Judge Hunt's uh, suggestion of allowing the clerks to return it for correction if the proposed order is the lead document. Um, those sort of things might help in this, but uh, it is a, a huge problem that this proposed order gets the certificate. The judge signs it, it's not like the order was served. Really so, and Todd, you look like you were going to say something as well. Yeah, I do have my hand raised and I'll take it down uh, when I get done talking. But so, I mean, we do have at least two possible solutions to this, but, but you know, and I don't have anything to add to what Judge Hines said about uh, a cover letter as a lead document. That is the solution that's currently being used in some locations to get around this. I think Travis County uh, is doing that perhaps. Um, and I, I don't know that I heard it mentioned, though, that you know, proposed orders are not orders. So there's nothing that would prevent court staff from just removing that automated certificate of service before uh, sending it back through as a signed order. So I just want to add that to the list of possible solutions. Um, but my bigger concern here is, and I'll, I'll just kind of echo what I understand Blake's position to be. Um, we don't need to go backwards and say that anything is going to be removed or exempted from the automated certificate of service without uh, a really thorough vetting of the idea. And, and I think we're on our way to doing that. Uh, we've got some things that definitely need to be talked about. Um, but that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell. You know, we, we need to consider these ideas further before taking any action. Hey, say something in, in response to that. It is under 21A. So if you submit a proposed order not attached to a motion or in court, you're required to attach a certificate of service under 21A subpart D, falling back to B. So it, it is required. The question is, is there is the language confusing? But I see what you're saying, but wouldn't it automatically append a second Yes. Certificate when you signed it and put it in. So there would always be two. So, so why, hold on, Tracy, why would there not be when the judge then signs it and e files the signed order? Or just don't e file. But aren't we talking about getting all of the orders in the e file? Right. It depends on how we set up the e file in the, in the research Texas. But, um, but our judges, we prep that document once it gets filed. It gets prepped for their judge's signature. So the exact document that was filed is prepped for that judge's signature. Right. If we have to manipulate and delete a page, which we don't have tools to do that right now, that would be extra work that we don't have time to do. So deleting the page is not an option as far as I'm concerned. Um, but as soon as that document is prepped for the judge, when they sign it in our system, it gets sent back to the clerk for her to get into our case management system. Right, it goes into our case management system. Then a notice is sent out to the attorneys that it's there for them to look at. But nothing's ever e filed back in, nothing's ever e served. That order that well, the, the, the judge signed then gets noticed to the attorneys that that order has been signed. I, the case. If, if, we, if we can not use e file because there are different variances of how a judge will electronically get documents for and this is just orders back to the clerk so let's just do, use um, the the uh, preferred uh, submission process instead of email because everybody does it differently i would prefer that we do it uh, that they were submitted that they were submitted electronically for, through email but i think at some point the discussion just for what we were saying but I, I agree with you uh, and also we were Tracy, but we got 254 counties. I think what we should do is start looking at how we're going to do this in a hybrid environment because we still have to take that into consideration. Those of us who e-file our signed orders don't have this problem. There's two certificates of service. And, and, and I, if you're right now. But the whole, the whole <laughs> point of changing the rules 
is to try to <laughs> to but try and, to solve the, the problem. And, 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 and I think that you, you make a good point, but I, I think um, a lot of uh, members of the judiciary, they see what you're doing as such a, as such a hurdle that they have to go over, not knowing, not, not realizing that if you just spend a short period learning this process, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes, and the quicker you're able to execute that process. And that's, that's the big hurdle that, now, that we now have to deal with. Couldn't we do that through training on the eighth floor upstairs or court administration? Because I don't do it, but my court coordinator does it. Yeah. And, and, but, I, but I'll tell you, I, and I, I've been a court administrator, court coordinator, I, I've done all of that. And, um, but uh, it seems like, and, and when, when, I, when I was elected, that's when I learned that the, the clerk's office, uh, county clerk or district clerk became the dumping ground for the things that nobody wanted to do. But if you, give them the, if you understand the volume of everything that we have to do, that's why clerk's offices have been behind forever. Is because we're doing everybody else's work and not really focusing on our own, and that's that's one of the things that I just basically wall that up and said, "No, we, we can't continue to do that. We have to get our office on the right track." The interesting dispute we have on this thing is funny because the judges are saying, "Let the judges be responsible," and the clerks are telling us the judges won't be responsible, and so we're at this point where we say we can solve it if the court administrators do it. Mm -hmm. So the clerks don't have to, and the clerks say, well, the courts won't do it, and so we'll still have to, and so here we sit. But, and I, think, I don't know where we go. For but, 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 and, and I think uh, a lot of clerks, they are, they are uh, in some instances, that I won't, I won't back my tongue. They're bullied by their, uh, by their judiciary, and, and so they kind of roll over. So, and then you have uh, people like me, I look at a judge like, uh, excuse me, and, but, but and, I mean, I'll work with them, but I'm not going to do your job. You know, it seems to me we all know that in each of the counties, there are certain traditions and, and cultures about who does what and how we divide up the work. Uh, the metro areas are, are much different than a multi-county uh, judicial district and, and everything in, in between. It seems to me the first step would be to define and, and write out what is the preferred slash optimal procedure for this process to take and get, but, and get agreement on that. But and, order, then, and then go to, who does this impact? And is the impact such that we need to make some adjustments? But in order to do that, there is a lot of ambiguity in the way that the, the statutes are written because of, well, uh, we were talking about that earlier, when you say courts, does it really mean the courts? Then if it says, Whatever does well, it John, mean. we can put this at whatever level y'all want to mm -hmm. and have recommendations as to who it falls to and why. Yeah. But to me, there is enough ambiguity in this, and that's why we need to get something in writing exactly. that everybody can look at and react to and then take it for wherever that, that, that leads us. So but otherwise, we'll be talking about this in 23. So does this, does this lead us to another <laughs> subcommittee? Justice Simmons and Bob? I think, it's I, think we, I, I think we do need a committee of the clerks. Because I need to understand these processes better. I look at it as a judge that, I'm sorry, I'm responsible for my orders being correct. And I wouldn't sign an order that had all kinds of different file stamps on it. I would you know, sign a clean order. But I don't know if the process is such that it's very complicated and the judge doesn't really understand what they're signing or how that process works. So I think we need a subcommittee just to get a better handle, as Bob said, on what, what is the preferred process out there and how does this all work? Justice Simmons, this is uh, John Warren. I, I, I really would like, while we have um, um, the majority line share, Lions share for the or should I say, uh, we have more urban clerks. Uh, on, I really would like to see a very, very significant number of smaller counties to participate because their processes are far more difficult than ours. We get sure involved in yeah. and yeah. recommendations. Sure, yeah. sure, is happy to get us recommendations. Yeah. But if, if I can, that, that also requires a lot of education. I got uh, 
an email from a criminal lawyer who proceeded to tell me how I was not doing my job as it relates to judicial records. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't touch judicial records at all. There's a difference between a judicial record and a court record. And the only records that I'm responsible for are those that are filed with the clerk and orders that are signed by the judge. If you're talking about a plea that you all want to negotiate, that has nothing to do with me. <laughs> so I... <laughs> Okay. Any further? Do we have a committee or do we have a group that wants to look at this closer? Bob, do you want to see if, if there are people there that want to work on this? There are, and, and uh, Casey's going to talk with Sherry. Okay. Um, about getting some clerks from some of the uh, smaller, less populated counties around. And we certainly, and we want a, uh, a multi county district for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. to go through this. And what, what I would recommend is once we get those folks identified in their agreement to serve, that we actually set a, like, like we did, did prior to 2020, the work session. actually set a face-to-face a -face work session for those that want to be involved yeah. and start it at the beginning and literally walk through the, the flow of this. Um, okay. Can, last, can I chime in? No, Can I section, chime in here, please? Section. I'm sorry to interrupt, Bob. I, what we're talking about here is so closely related to the work that the order subcommittee is doing that I, I think we need to be considering these things together. Um, okay. And certainly there's no issue with uh, representation among smaller clerk's office uh, offices in terms of what's feasible. But I think before we go and create another subcommittee, um, you know, that's going to have work that substantially overlaps what the order subcommittee has already started down the road with, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's more of an expansion to some degree of our, um, our existing subcommittee. And certainly no one's going to have any objection to, um, you know, having rural clerks participate, we might, I think we might could use some more judges on our subcommittee uh, to, to hear their viewpoints too. Uh, Judge Ferguson just joined the subcommittee and I, I see that Judge Carruth is, is on it too. So we'll certainly reach out to her, but if we have others, uh, other judges who are willing to participate uh, in that subcommittee, then we certainly want them to, to speak up and, and join us. And your committee's expanded. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Carlos and Todd, I'll, I'll reach out to you with uh, clerk suggestions to expand that committee as well, and then since we're, we're adding that to the scope. Well, Casey, yeah, I agree. And, and let me just say that, that I think what Bob mentioned, we need to have that process, you know, and, and we can call it whatever we want, go through subcommittee or new subcommittee. But I, I think that that engagement at that level with everybody who's interested participating and having a, a sort of an hour or two hours set aside just to do that, I think is, is important. So I'm glad that the subcommittee is, is welcoming new members. Uh. So does that mean this is more of a uh, focus group of the uh, subcommittee? Or yeah, it's, it's, it's another facet of the same subcommittee. Because if you think about it, it's the order subcommittee is their their charge is how do we get orders into research, but then in doing that work, they have to know this is the process of how orders work, and this is a piece on the front and the back. It's still related to orders. Still yeah, related to way. orders, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the last item that we had on new business was uh, regarding the flow of sealed documents through e-filing. Uh, Laura Hinojosa had brought this up and we've, we've seen other work being started on juvenile case filings as well, juvenile, juvenile cases. Um, but right now, it's all it is is a policy prohibition of you cannot file sealed documents or sealed cases through e-file. And so, um, 
again, Laura Hinojosa brought this up saying, is there any way we can, we can talk about getting that prohibition lifted? Um, I've spoken briefly with our friends at Tyler and this is other states. I do believe Terry and Evan allow sealed documents to flow through e-filing. So that's mainly just a configuration thing on our side to get that. Uh, my understanding too from Terry is that since the time we started, this rule went into place in 2012, 2013, that Tyler has done a significant amount of work with how the EFM treats uh, documents a little bit. I'll let Bob talk. Briefly, the history of this is nobody wanted to touch sealed documents until we had the primary e-filing system up running. People had experience with it, had confidence in it, and it was and it became the way we filed cases in and documents in Texas. There was no other reason. People were reluctant to, if you recall, uh, juvenile has been the last case type that we have done in this system uh, throughout. So from my perspective, uh, unless someone has a specific reason, I think it's time to sunset that policy and move forward. And I think one of the other things that was going on too, Bob, was that I know Blake had some concerns initially that even with the ability to tell the EFM this document is confidential or sealed, that some clerks may miss that flag and end up putting it out on the web, which is not what we want to have happen. I thought the whole point of a sealed document or a sealed case is so that nobody sees it but the judge and the court staff. And if we're allowing it to be filing, that's kind of not following the rules of stuff. But if, but if I'm an attorney and hire a runner to give it to you, then they can see it. Well, that's up to the attorney. It's, it's up to so, the attorney. Yeah. Tracy, do you all scan those documents? Does any or do you scan sealed documents? We do, but we have a lot of security behind our documents, and some of our district clerk staff do not even see sealed documents. It's only the judges. And certain district clerk staff that even can see this is a document well, it's the same thing then. I mean, I think, frankly, um, I think the federal government, you file sealed documents. I don't think there's any difference really in the process. I think you can probably secure e-filed or digital documents just as well, if not better than paper documents that then you're scanning and putting into a system. But that's just my thought at the time. But I do think it's time for us to really look at that. I think it's time to just move forward with digital um, on the sealed okay, if, documents. If you're filing it through e-filing. Not only can any clerk see that, but also anybody in Tyler can see that, especially as we know, documents have trouble getting through the e-filing system. We have to put in support tickets. That error filing then gets opened up by anybody to see and handle. So I don't, I still have an issue with putting these through e-filing systems. Tracy, we can say that about every document and every type of prescription, whether it's a sealed document or a document that in our matrix we have said should be should be hidden or otherwise uh, removed from, from various disclosures. I mean, I don't disagree with you, but the fact of the matter is that can apply in every single circumstance. Usually the sensitive data that's on the document it's not in these other documents that we're talking about. But it can still apply to them. This is Dan. Can I say something? Sure. So I, I, I do think we need to update what we're doing. But I also definitely recognize Tracy's concerns. And one of the big differences when we're talking about who inside, inside the world can still see the document is right now, if it's, if it's physically filed under seal, you know, the attorney hands it to the district clerk. It always stays in the hands of someone who is answerable to the district clerk or to the county clerk. Both of, and, and all of those people along the way are officers of the court. 
who are subject to the order of the judge sealing that document. Because we can't file anything under seal unless there's an order from the court. That means that anyone who leaks it to the press or leaks it to a disgruntled, you know, former spouse or to a PI, it's not just, you know, a, a violation of certain laws. They're also subject to contempt and the judge can bring the hammer down on them directly. Right now, I'm not sure that the sealing orders would impose that kind of discipline on someone at Tyler, for instance, who, who whether through negligence or intentionally, lets slip a, a sealed document. And so perhaps one way to look at this is figuring out a way to make it clear that whoever is in that process of handling a sealed document electronically is still answerable to the same extent as the deputy clerk sitting outside the judge's office who's handling it. Um, because right now, uh, if Judge Ferguson orders a document sealed and for some reason uh, it, it, you know, someone at Tyler gets a hold of it, it's, it's, it's got, information about a new oil play out in West Texas. And that person then, you know, uh, takes that information and runs with it, sells it to an insider trader or something like that. There may be some SEC consequences. The FBI may get involved, but really what can Judge Ferguson do to that person? Whereas if it was the deputy clerk sitting outside of Judge Ferguson's office, he just calls his bailiff in he hands them a show cause order and says, you know, be here tomorrow to tell me why I shouldn't hold you in contempt of court for violating my sealing order. And so that, that that's kind of where I, I see where Tracy's coming from is there's, there is, while yes, there are a lot of people who see sealing sealed documents, the, the, the exposure there is where is the authority to impose consequences on one of those pieces that's where the weakness is, I think. Most so, of the yeah. information I've seen, this is Rebecca, and I, I just think based on the history in the federal courts of their sealed documents going digitally in, based on the leaks that I've seen in the press that have never come from an agent, right, of, a, of, of someone managing it. I mean, the same could be said for who's management, managing your document management system. What company is handling that. These are all agents. I think that is kind of a far-fetched, no offense, I think they would be in contempt of court. They would have breached their contract. Tyler would have. I think there are ramifications for this kind of thing. But I mean, they're all worthy to explore. I, I don't, I'm not discounting our concerns about security, Dan and, and Tracy. Um, I just think that, uh, that I think documents can be even more secure digitally than they can in paper, particularly if people are scanning them and handling them. And where do the hard copies go? And who else looking at that? And what about the janitor opening the file? Who is a contracted janitorial service, perhaps? I mean, I just, I, I just um, think that, um, I, I think just moving forward with a, a digital set would be preferable, but we can, we can you know, have more discussion on that and, and, and look into that further. Justice Simmons, may I say something here? Um, this is Sion again. I would, I, I don't disagree with everything that's being said, but I would ask you to remember as we think through this that this is more than just some confidential contract or something like that that inadvertently gets leaked. Remember, this could also be a juror's questionnaire on a capital murder case that has been attached as a sealed exhibit to something and it gets leaked and that person potentially gets killed. So this is more than just contempt of court. It has to be secure. And I would just ask that everybody remember that there are much more severe consequences on the criminal side to uh, seal documents than, than there are necessarily on the civil side. So I'll 
the technologists will throw this out on them and start writing checks to carry us to Canada. There is a technical solution to this problem. We do it already. I have to store documents in a cloud that are sensitive and highly confidential, and I can't allow my cloud vendor to read them. Furthermore, I can't allow my cloud vendor to surrender them under court order because the counterparty might be the US government. So we use an encryption key management service from another cloud provider. So if any of you were to store documents in my box space, eblawdotbox.com, when you put it in, Box will go get from my key server an encryption key, encrypt it, store it in there, and Box can't read it. This is required for us to handle confidential documents on behalf of our clients. I'm not, I'm not sure why we can't use a system like this. I don't know how you get the EFSPs to well, we, use the same thing, but essentially the files are encrypted as they travel through the system. Right. And so I, I believe that's the case because Terry, and Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, because my understanding is that our EFM environment is CGIS compliant, which would then turn around and require that documents be stored in an encrypted state while they're there. And then as they're traveling through, they're also going through an encrypted tunnel. So it is the case that, that when they're in, those documents are in Tyler's possession, that their, their computing staff behind the scenes or their cloud vendor can't see any of that stuff. We would just have to raise that to the level that whenever the attorney tells the EFL or the FSP, this is sealed, or whoever's putting it into the filing system, then a new key is requested that is kept under the control of whatever court decides. And no one can open it until they get that encryption key back. Right. So we it's in the e-filing system, but no one can read it unless they get the authorized permission to access that key. I, again, I don't know if that functionality exists or can be added at the user level to eVault Texas, but it exists in the commercial world. I and I'd, so. I'd be very interested to see what the feds are doing with their filing system. I mean, I'm sure they also are very concerned about security in many of their cases. Okay, any further comments? We will move this topic to the, along to the, and have it on the next agenda. Sure. All right, anything else? Just the same as any other uh, information you'd like to provide or share or comments you'd like to make before we adjourn? No, but as always, I love this lively group and our lively discussions. <laughs> so I look forward to our next meeting. Okay. I was. Uh, okay. I, I, I hate to do this, but I was going to go backwards and just suggest a name. I know uh, Sherry's name was mentioned uh, in, in regards to the, the potential training with different clerks in rural areas and urban areas and stuff uh, down the road. Kim Pachowiak at OCA runs, I think, the domestic violence training, uh, and she may have a good model to take and use as a starting point for training. When, when you get to that point, uh, she seems really, really, really on top of things. Uh, and again, works with Sherry. Uh, so that might be or, organic uh, tap there. Thank you, Mark. You're, you're right. Thanks. Tim works with us and I know her well. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Unless anybody has anything else, we will stand adjourned until our next meeting. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>